Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's update concerning the reopening of the city of Indianapolis and Marion County. First, uh, I want to say, as always, I deeply appreciate the sacrifices that Marion County residents have made <clears throat> to slow the spread of this deadly virus. Beyond the almost unthinkable numbers of those who have been sickened or have died by, uh, as a result of COVID-19, there are countless more in our community that continue to feel the effect of this global pandemic. And they have responded with patience, with grace, and with bravery. And I thank the community for its commitment in that regard. I also want to again acknowledge the work of Governor Holcomb uh, and the state health officials in creating the back on track framework that provides recommendations to local units of government uh, on the order in which our businesses uh, should reopen and the best practices that they should utilize when the time comes to reopen those businesses. It has been an invaluable resource as we've analyzed our local data and put together the next steps for Marion County. And to that end, I also want to thank once again, Governor Holcomb for allowing local policies that are more restrictive than the statewide guidance so that individual cities and counties can respond to the unique challenges presented by the COVID-19 outbreak uh, and how individual jurisdictions uh, understandably differ uh, in the way they are responding uh, to the pandemic. Here in a moment, I'll be turning over things to my partner my valuable partner, Dr. Virginia Kane, who continues to rely on a lifetime of studying infectious diseases as she leads the Marion County Public Health Department. In her presentation, Dr. Kane will articulate the data that we are now seeing here in Indianapolis and why we believe that that data tells a story of how the sacrifices made across the county continue to save lives and how that data will show uh, that we are now on a path uh, toward reopening incrementally our local economy. But before we get to the policy changes, I wanna be clear. The data that we are looking at uh, may look scientific, but at the end of the day, the numbers and charts aren't just facts and figures. They are people. They are our neighbors, our loved ones, our first responders, our healthcare workers, our older adults in long-term care facilities. People who are sick and dying today people who may unfortunately fall ill to the virus in the future. And critically, people all across our city who have been doing their part to slow the spread of the disease by wearing face coverings, by avoiding unnecessary travel, and by making the difficult choice to not gather with family and friends. And as we begin down the path toward this new normal, I wanna offer my thanks and a challenge to not let our guard down, even as we prepare for greater flexibility over the coming weeks. It is because of what we have done that we are moving forward by a few steps but it will, be, it will be because of what we will do 
that we will be able to complete this journey. To that end, let's talk about what those first steps look like. This morning, we are announcing, Dr. Kane and I together are announcing that on Friday, May 15th, this coming Friday, Indianapolis will begin implementing portions of phase two. I say portions because there will be certain aspects of the back on track phase two that will not take effect in Marion County on May 15th. I know that these delays will be frustrating to some, but I assure you that we are making these decisions in an effort not just to reduce the prevalence of COVID-19 in our community now, but also reduce the likelihood that it returns in the future and forces stricter restrictions all over again. Dr. Kane will go over these new orders in greater detail, but to summarize, starting on May 15th, this Friday, we will be moving restrictions on in-person public gatherings, including religious services, from 10 people to 25 people. Drive up religious services where worshipers remain in their cars will also continue to be permitted, as well as many houses of worship who on their own have already planned to continue virtual worshiping for the next several weeks, and in some cases, the next several months. In addition, we will be allowing for the qualified reopening of non-essential retail outlets at 50% capacity. We will also be allowing for the qualified opening of shopping malls, subject to restrictions on capacity and food service. As it relates to restaurants, starting Friday, May 22nd, starting Friday, May 22nd, we will be permitting in-person dining at restaurants, but only in outdoor seating and with strict social distancing guidelines. With each of these loosened restrictions, social distancing, social distancing measures for customers and PPE for employees are required. Let me take a quick moment to clarify uh, a few examples of what we will not be implementing at this time. Non-essential industrial and manufacturing must remain closed. Personal services such as hair and nail salons must also remain closed. And in-person dining that occurs inside of a restaurant will continue to be restricted at this time. These delays are not driven by politics or spite, but by careful analysis of all the data available to us. And importantly, we believe that if the trajectory of this virus continues to stabilize and hopefully decline, the remainder of these phase two reopenings may be possible as soon as June the 1st. Furthermore, we are mindful that these continued restrictions will create new and greater hardships for residences and businesses. That is why today we are announcing additional programming that will come online in the coming weeks. First, I'm proud to say that city county government is in the process of securing a stockpile of face coverings that can be provided to Marion County residents free of charge. Put another way, we are hopeful that within the next week, details will be released on pickup and delivery options so that any resident who needs a mask can and will receive a mask. Second, 
We recognize that obtaining and installing the required personal protective equipment represents a significant burden for those seeking to reopen under this and future guidance, especially our smaller businesses. That is why today we are announcing the creation of a $5 million grant program that will provide, these grants will provide reimbursements of up to $5,000 in qualified EPE expenses for our smaller businesses throughout Marion County. This program will be in partnership with the Indy Chamber, and we will have more on this program in the coming days. But interested businesses can go to www.response.indychamber.com slash restart to sign up to receive more information. Third, we understand that placing such an emphasis on the importance of outdoor seating capacity, that will present many challenges for many of our restaurants. That is why we are announcing this morning that we will be providing assistance to individual restaurants in order to secure temporary permitting and permission to expand outdoor seating capacity when it is legal and advisable. In addition, we will be actively working with our major cultural and commercial thoroughfares to expand access to the right-of-way, including perhaps possible road closures to allow greater outdoor seating and service area for restaurants and other businesses. In this way, we can not only provide greater opportunity for business success, but also provide a greater buffer in order to comply with the social distancing orders. To connect with the city to learn more in the days ahead, I encourage you to visit indy.gov slash dine in. indy.gov slash dine in. Now, we understand that providing the start date of phase two will inevitably raise questions about when phases three through five will begin. To, to be blunt, we are not yet releasing target dates for those future phases, but we will continue to urge residents and businesses to familiarize themselves with the governor's back on track plan. If your business is not part of today's announcement about our implementation, the beginning of phase two in Marion County, make sure you are preparing for the phase in which your business can reopen. Our commitment is that in the interim, we will provide weekly updates on data, and we are hopeful that two weeks from this briefing, we will be able to provide greater clarity on next steps that may take place on June 1 and future phases. These are incredibly difficult times for so many of us. And I wish I could sit here and say that we can guarantee a consistent decline in rates of infection over the coming weeks. Unfortunately, that is something I cannot do. It is why we have worked diligently to keep our hospital beds and health care centers from crowding. Until there's a vaccine, we cannot completely stop the spread of COVID-19. But based on the hard work of the Marion County Public Health Department, and frankly, based on the hard work of each and every one of you, we are more confident than ever before that we can manage this outbreak and adopt policies that protect our most vulnerable neighbors. In doing so, and by acting in ways 
that protect our families and our neighbors. We will display that which is most characteristically Indianapolis, a tapestry of diverse neighborhoods and cultures, united in a noble purpose, working toward the goal of a better tomorrow for one city. That is what Indianapolis remains, one city, and we will go forward together. Dr. King. Thank you, Mayor Hotstead, for your leadership. You know, over the last two weeks, partners across our city have worked hard to expand the availability of testing to bring it to our community who have been impacted by this virus and encourage social distancing practices. These efforts have helped to slow the progression of COVID-19 in Indianapolis, which is allowing us to move into a modified stage two. This morning, I will detail the latest Marion County data and outline what stage two will look like in Indianapolis. The most important goal for us is to assure that the health and well-being of the community by mitigating the spread of this disease and limiting the severity of the cases where they're not having to be hospitalized uh, resulting in deaths. And our other most critical thing is that we really need to alleviate our individuals and our community's economic hardship through a phase approach. And we think that these goals will be critical to curtailing this COVID-19 disease. So I want to just identify uh, in this slide that there is currently there's no currently no one ideal data point to show we're slow to spread COVID-19. But by looking at a set of benchmarks from testing to contact tracing to emergency room department visits and mortality, we can show that Marion County is heading in the right direction. Some of the critical uh, indicators that we refuse to identify sustained reduction in the incidents, new cases for at least 14 days. So one of the things that we've looked at is we've seen a decrease in the emergency uh, emergency visits or runs. And <clears throat> from surveillance, uh, we know that we're seeing a um, we're not seeing an increase now in COVID-19 cases. We also look at the different sentinel populations, such as the uh, homeless, uh, people incarcerated. We look to see if there's a decrease in the number of COVID-19 related hospitalizations. Most important, we look at a decrease in the percent of positive COVID-19 tests. And based on all these multiple benchmarks, with consultation with our expert panel, a number of ex, uh, epidemiologists, uh, the Fairbanks School of Public Health and others, uh, we've been able to be able to monitor our progress to date that allowed us to go from modified phase two. Let's just take, first of all, the ED visits with COVID-19 symptoms. As you can see, we have started to see a sustained decrease in our emergency room visits with COVID-19 system, symptoms in our ERs. We've also, um, and let me just explain this, I think this is an important uh, point for you to look at. So these are our new COVID-19 cases that are current per day. Now, if you looked at the slide, you said, wow, it looks like our cases are going up. But let me just inform you that since the old criteria was established, 
we now have, since that time, we now have had a significant amount of expanded testing in our communities. So what happens when you're able to bring broad spread testing in our communities? You find new cases, okay? But these new cases that we're picking up now is a lot of our uh, background cases that have been in our community. So you have to try to delineate what are the true increases of cases versus you see this phenomena of, because I'm doing so much broad-based testing now in our communities, you always find positive cases. So that's why these other benchmarks are so important, like a decrease in hospitalizations, for example. So as you can tell, we've been seeing a sustained decrease in our hospital admissions for persons with COVID-19 uh, positive tests. Next slide. Um, you will also see that at the very end of this curve that we started to see a decrease in the deaths per day. Next slide. And then most important of all of this is we want to look at how high, when we were testing people, were people positive for all the tests that we were doing? And as you can see, like way back on April the 1st, um, uh, April the 8th, that we had almost 45% of our testing were positive of all the tests we were doing each day. And then, um, as you can see, May the 6th, that we have roughly dropped to almost just a little bit above 30%. So we're seeing the number of positive tests in our communities go down. And this is probably one of the most critical benchmarks we look at. So another thing that's important is for us to be able to respond to this epidemic, we have to know that we have sufficient capacity in our healthcare system to handle for any potential sur surges. So we may get another um, uh, peak related to this. And when we, when we go back, we see that we have 86% occupancy of our medical and surgical beds. So we have at least 206 beds that are available staffed and we have 1,247 uh, beds that are occupied. So we have that surge sufficient capacity in order to handle a potential surge. Very comfortable about that. Now, one of the most important things that we need in order to really see significant declines in our cases is we have to have enough testing in our communities to identify those positives as they are occurring to be able to do contact tracing uh, at least of a rate of 75%. So that means if I got a new case, I need to know immediately who you've been in contact with the last 14 days. So I can interview those individuals, test anybody that's symptomatic and have them self quarantined for 14 days. So these two are the most critical points that you will see. And so that's why we've got to do more broad based testing in our communities. We're glad for Kroger coming on as a new partner but look to hear more partners coming uh, and more sites being announced in the very near future. So conclusion, social distancing is really critical and it is working as our metrics continue to trend downward. But we have to be very vigilant. We cannot ease up on these restrictions. We have to do those frequent hand washings. We have to if we're ill, cover our, our mouth when we're sneezing with tissue paper and whatever. And I, I want to say in ramping up this contact tracing and partnership with community groups to city, I want to sing, signal out the Fairbanks School of Public Health, Dr. Paul Havison and members of his staff, uh, like Dr. Uh, Josh Vess um, and other members uh, they've been critical in helping us with our technical ex expertise, along with our own epidemiology staff under Director uh, Joe Gibson for the Marion County Public Health Department. Um, uh, we just appreciate 
of their input uh, in helping us address this epidemic. So our next steps for phase two. So as we have just emphasized and the mayor's emphasized, our non-essential retail um, can occur at 50% capacity. Public gatherings, including religious services, are up to can be up to 25 people. Liquor stores at 50% capacity, and we have this wonderful. Um, um, you know, I'm a book reader. I love love murder mystery, and so for the Indianapolis Public Library, central location and their branches, they are going to be providing curbside pickups for a lot of their library, library materials. So we're very excited about that. Subsequently, our order for outdoor dining for restaurants will take effect uh, Memorial um, weekend. So it includes the outdoor dining for restaurants by Memorial Day. So thank you uh, in regard to those remarks. And I want to thank again, Amir Hotset for the staff that you have and what are all you're doing for this community and all of our community partners. I can't name them all, but just the support that you have brought to help our uh, vulnerable populations, our businesses and everything. Uh, just want to give those kudos again to uh, a number of the faith-based communities. So I'll take this time now to introduce uh, Mr. Paul Babcock, who's director of the Office of Public Health and safety. Thanks, Dr. Kane. Um, thank you, Mayor Hawkset and Dr. Kane for your leadership in this. Um, the logo that you see on the screen right now is our Safe Start to Summer campaign. And what it does is it helps really uh, our residents understand where we are when it comes to uh, phasing into our uh, restrictions in Marion County, how we ease them. So this will be pushed out on social media channels uh, in English, uh, Spanish, and Burmese. And what it does is it provides an easy uh, step to guide to talk about the new programs that the mayor announced today. It helps explain uh, to residents what's going to open. So it has a list of non-essential retail opening first, restaurants on the 22nd with outdoor dining, malls and individual retail, retail stores with 50% capacity. And then it talks about where we're going here in the future. And it reminds everyone uh, that like the visual, they must continue to wear our PPE and to really focus on social distancing. And it also then has a, a second part to it. And that part includes for our uh, businesses and our residents. And it talks about uh, what's coming next. So hopefully as we continue to be vigilant, salons and barbershops will be able to open in the near future, as well as non-essential manufacturing and industry. Uh, but most importantly, it really helps us, us as neighbors, as us as citizens of Marion County, to easily understand how we're tracking both with the governor's plan, um, but what we need to do to continue to move forward here in Marion County, to continue the data points uh, looking really, really good. So look for, look to see the Safe Start to Summer program being launched uh, today and look for it across your social media channels. And we ask that you continue to, uh, one, be vigilant, but two, tweet this out or share it on Facebook or other platforms so that friends and neighbors across Marion County can really get the appropriate information uh, to know where we are in Marion County and how we continue to go forward safely and healthily. And with that, I'll turn it over to Taylor Schaefer. We will now open it up for questions. As always, if you type your name and outlet into the Q&A box, I promise we will uh, get through those today. Um, our first question is from Eric Berman, WIBC. Hello, can you hear me? Excellent, uh, Taylor, thank you. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, question for you, sir, as far as the outdoor dining, a uh, couple of aspects of that I'm curious about. How do businesses with a short frontage, or for that matter, businesses that, that have a large frontage but don't have outdoor dining, how specifically do you see them expanding beyond what they have? And how will the potential road closures work without creating other problems for people just trying to get around the city? Paul, you want to take that? Sir, so uh, that's a great question. We have put together a plan with DPW to 
work through the logistics of that to both ensure the safety of our residents, uh, the safety of our public safety vehicles so they can get to uh, where they need to go as quickly as possible. And we hope to, in the relatively near future, be able to put that out in a couple areas um, to one, show folks that uh, outdoor dining can happen and we can do it in a safe and efficient manner, as well as be able to then work with other neighborhood groups uh, have that same other neighborhood groups and restaurants to be able to show and do it in their area. So in partnership with DPW, our public safety professionals, as well as uh, BNS, we've come up with a plan that we think is going to be a great model to allow outdoor dining with our restaurants. We hope to launch it soon. Sir. Yeah, Eric, <clears throat> Eric, I just add that um, as the city, uh, you know, there's, there's permitting issues uh, and, and there's no real general application uh, that would be uh, that would that, that would apply across the board. It's all going to be individual and specific. But the city wants to remain flexible and responsive uh, to um, encourage uh, re responsibly encourage uh, as much outdoor dining uh, as is uh, reasonable and, and and have that begin. Um, May 22nd, uh, and uh, we can uh, dine outside uh, with social distancing restrictions uh, the entire uh, Memorial Day weekend, uh, and hopefully have many, many restaurants get back up and running in that regard. Russ McQuaid, Fox 59. And Good afternoon, good morning, or am I there? Hey, Russ. And good morning for both uh, Dr. Kane and for the mayor. How tenuous is the progress we're making in continuing a downward slope on these statistics? And how will we know if these first tentative steps we are taking in the next two weeks uh, perhaps will boomerang on us and cause a rethinking of this process and a re-hunkering down in two weeks? I'll answer that question, um, uh, Russ. That that is probably the most critical question we're probably going to hear today, and I have to make the point that based on our benchmarks that we are looking at, um, you, and that was why the delay for us in terms of uh, going to this stage two, that we will have to critically monitor this data over the next two weeks. Uh, to see whether we're able to maintain no significant increase in our cases by looking at our four benchmarks. And, but of course, if our benchmarks show that we are seeing a significant increase in our cases, we will have to revert and move back to stage one. Uh, we're very hopeful. We like the direction that we're going. We think with the additional uh, manpower that we're going to devote to contact tracing. The Indiana State Department of Health is, is also adding a significant number of contact uh, people as well as our local health department. So we feel pretty comfortable uh, in terms of really, once they're positive, reaching these folks within 24 hours. At least our goal is 95% of the individuals. And if we're effective in at least 75% you should start seeing us continue our trends so that we hope that we can go to our our next modified phase of stage two. But we will definitely have to monitor all of our benchmarks and our indicators. And we have an expert panel looking and reviewing that. And and Russ, I'd, I'd simply add, uh, <clears throat> these are complicated issues. There's no two ways about it. Uh, I'm sure that as the result of today's announcement, there will be some in the community who say that we're moving too slowly. Uh, there will probably be many in the community who might uh, think we're moving too fast. Um, but I want to make it clear, uh, we are moving as the data drives us to move. Uh, these are not decisions made on the basis of public opinion. These are decisions made on the basis of public health. Uh, I trust Dr. Kane's leadership and her team. 
obviously she mentioned many of the individuals who have been responsible for advising us on these matters. So um, I, I don't anticipate unanimity of support or frankly unanimity of opposition, uh, but we are phasing in phase two and I think we're doing so responsibly. But as Dr. Kane indicates, if the, if the data starts to show that there will be uh, an uptick, um, then we'll have to make adjustments accordingly. Sam Quinn, IBJ. Hi, my question this morning is sort of in regards to increased homeless activity. We're seeing downtown more encampments, things like that. So is the city doing anything now to address that as people prepare to return to work and dining out uh, in downtown? Paul. Yes, sir. So thank you for the question. Uh, that's definitely something that we've all been extremely focused on here um, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we want to make sure that our homeless neighbors are not um, impacted in a negative fashion by COVID-19. And so in partnership with the health department, uh, the city has set up a number of temporary emergency shelters, which has helped alleviate some of the uh, pressure that our, our good colleagues at Wheeler Mission and in the other homeless uh, shelters have faced as well as now we're working with um, HUD and the state to be able to set up a non-congregate uh, housing facility, which is in a, a complicated way of saying, giving hopefully individual rooms on a temporary basis to our homeless neighbors to get them off the streets, but at the same time to be able to ensure our social distancing. Our IMPD homeless unit is continuing to work with uh, our homeless neighbors to ensure that they get access to uh, the care that they need. Uh, and as there is increased activity downtown, well, we will continue to remain vigilant with our public safety professionals to make sure that our, our residents uh, are, are safe and that the, our homeless neighbors are also taken care of. Rick Callahan, Associated Press. This is Rick. Um, my question is uh, pertaining to uh, contract uh, contact tracing and it's for Dr. Kane. And uh, questions. Uh, how many contact tracers does Marion County need um, to keep the population safe from the reemergence of the virus? And um, how, ma how many does the county have now? And, and if, if it's short, uh, what are the plans for um, finding those additional people to do that work? So if you looked at the criteria that's set up by the Association of State Health Commissioners and also the Association of Local and County Health Departments, they're saying that you need to have uh, 50 contact tracers, I believe, per 100,000. So we've estimated that we probably need a total of 300 contact uh, tracers. Uh, currently, we've identified at least 75 contact tracers for Marion County. But we our goal is to try to reach 150. And we also need to know that we're working very closely with the Indiana State Department of Health, who is also uh, just announced with the governor uh, this week, a huge plan to do contact tracing across the state of Indiana. Their goal is to hire as, as many as 1,000 contact um, tracing uh, individuals. So with the combination of our contact tracing folks and their folks that they're hiring that will be addressing Marion County, we feel very comfortable we'll have by next week at least 300 um, contact tracing folks that will help to devote attention to Marion County. So we're working hand in hand. So we just had our, our major meeting with the State Department of Health yesterday, working out the logistics, how we can work well together. Uh, but, you know, they have an enormous challenge as well as we do. Um, and so really trying to figure that, figure that out. Richard Essex, Wish TV. Good morning, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the time this morning. Two questions. For the July and Brickyard 400, two big events, same weekend. Where do you think we're going to be with holding both of those events this, right now? Yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, that's on uh, a lot of people's minds, and the, the, 
candid answer is it's too early uh, right now to tell. I will, uh, I will tell you that, that we have been in constant communication. Members of the city administration um, have been in constant communication with Mark Miles, Allison Melanchthon, Doug Bowles, and frankly, even Roger Penske. Um, and I know that um, uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway uh, is examining uh, many, many different scenarios as to uh, how the July 4th weekend may end up, uh, what, what, what it ends up looking like when we get there. So in direct answer to your question, it's too early to tell. We have made no decisions. Uh, but we are closely communicating with uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, and as we get closer uh, into the month of June and closer to the proposed July 4th events, uh, hopefully we'll have more data uh, in Marion County and the state. We'll have more data, um, but um, uh, it's too early to tell right now. Abdul Hakim Shabazz, Indy Politics. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Abdul. Uh, question for you. Uh, with some of the protests that we've seen recently uh, with respect uh, to the uh, Sean Reed shooting, how does that play into uh, what you folks are trying to do as you try to go forward uh, to reopen the city? you got people not necessarily wearing masks, not necessarily social distancing, uh, kind of like the, the protests we had at the governor's residence a couple weeks ago and also at the state house. Well, the, the truth is <laughs> it's a concern uh, when you have gatherings uh, of more than uh, now effective uh, this Friday, May 15th, gathering gatherings of more than 25 people and particularly when they are not uh, particularly cognizant of social distancing. Uh, there's no question that uh, the likelihood of the virus being uh, con contagiously spread uh, is increased. Uh, and uh, while um, no one is advocating that the right uh, to peacefully assemble uh, is not embedded in uh, those constitutional protections that we all enjoy, uh, I would be remiss if I did not encourage everyone who feels passionately about the issues confronting Indianapolis today uh, to be mindful that uh, they don't want to be infecting each other uh, in uh, their protests uh, or uh, be uh, contagious uh, and take it home with them to infect their families, uh, their parents, their grandparents, uh, unknowingly and unintentionally. So. It is indeed a concern of ours, uh, and we will continue to monitor uh, whenever uh, people gather uh, that to, and, and encourage that as long as they're together, we need them as a community uh, to be mindful uh, that it may not be the COVID-19 may not be the issue why they are coming together, but COVID-19 is present when they come together. So uh, I'm hopeful that they will be thoughtful in that regard. Amelia Pack Harvey, Indy Star. Hi, good morning. Um, I was just wondering uh, how the city is gonna be enforcing any reported violations of those businesses that aren't keeping social distancing guidelines or aren't having their employees wear PPE. Um, where can they report those to? Donnie or Thomas, you want to wade in on that? Sure, and I, and I may defer to Paul as well on the logistics of reporting. And he's um, intimately familiar with the, the process at the emergency operations center right now. Um, but so the health department will have a variety of options available to them to enforce their order. Some of those are civil options. Um, and, and you know, we, you've heard us say before that there's also potentially for, for an extreme situation, potential for an actual Missing citation, but I, you know, I think it's true that our approach will continue to be education first, um, and, and our goal uh, is to try to get compliance, not to be punitive. Um, but certainly, if we need to start stepping up enforcement, we have a lot of mechanisms to do that. The health department can 
it has options, everything from going to go get a, a court order closing down a business. It can actually, um, there are provisions in the state law where the health department can actually uh, take away, petition courts take away a business's license to operate. Um, and then obviously we can step up to uh, the potential the criminal citation for the misdemeanor if it's an extreme example. Um, Paul, on the logistics of reporting, do you mind taking that? Nope. So currently what we're doing is asking folks to send an email to eocmanager at indy.gov uh, and or call the non-emergency number. And depending upon the situation, uh, we've been working with our partners at the health department at IMPD to really uh, at first to Donnie's point, warn and then educate, which is why we've really created this safe start to summer program that outlines one social distancing guidelines and two PPE and then three reminds folks of what they're supposed to do in this space so that there are no punitive steps, but more importantly, so that we don't uh, continue to potentially spread COVID-19 because of the number, significant number of folks who are infected that may be asymptomatic spreaders. This is an aerosolized virus. And so our goal is to really keep people away from each other uh, and prevent droplets from getting on top of them. And so education, face masks are really the first step. And then as Donnie said, there are more punitive measures uh, that can be used against individuals who are uh, really, uh, the best way to look at it is putting the public's health in danger uh, by continuing to really abuse these guidelines. Eric Berman, WIBC. for just a second. Um, when we talk about road closures, Paul, are we envisioning sort of a festival atmosphere where restaurants could temporarily set up dining in the street and expand it that way? When you talk about a buffer, is that what we have in mind? Um, or if not, what is the purpose of that? That's a great question. Um, so I think the best way to say is that all options are on the table. Um, as the mayor pointed out earlier, you know, each, each location in the city is unique. And so our goal is to work with those locations, those businesses to find the safest uh, way to be able to allow them to have this opportunity to both operate as well as to operate safely in a, in a I guess for lack of a better description, change regulatory environment. And so there's no one size fits all for this. And I think that's what makes it a really fantastic program and a fantastic opportunity uh, for our businesses and restaurants here in Marion County um, because it will allow them to practice social distancing and at the same time to be outside as the weather gets better um, and you know hopefully continue to socially distance but at the same time operate. And we have one more question from Cameron Riddle at WRTV. Hi, good morning, uh, Mayor and Dr. Kane. Uh, when it comes to schools, you two were the first to shut down Marion County schools back in March. So this is usually the time where schools are planning for next year. So what are the conversations and guidance, um, if any conversations have been going on with schools so they can start planning uh, for a, what definitely is going to be a different school year? So actually, uh, we've been meeting with all the school uh, superintendents just on this very issue in terms of trying to determine what will uh, fall look like. Unfortunately, we don't have enough information or the data yet uh, to say uh, what we're going to do, but we have to sort of like have backup mm -hmm. options. So I can't say that we'll definitely be back in the schools uh, in the classrooms by fall, or, or our goal is that we hope that may be the case, but a lot will depend on not only what's happening in the state of Indiana, but surrounding states in um, increased travel and make differences in communities. And so right now, we're just too early to make that determination, but we're trying to have a backup, a backup plan. So I'm if my kids are going to be in school, this is what I need. But let's just say that we may still have to, ex to extend that restriction. Uh, what do we need to do early now, planning in order to make uh, that case? 
and trying to define what's the latest date uh, we need to know in regard to this information related to um, opening our schools back. And of course, we're going to be monitoring what's happening uh, with the governor and what's rec recommended for the entire state as well and having discussions with the Department of Education. But um, so these are uh, the things that are on the table now that we're actually just now looking at very closely. Yeah, and Cameron, I'd simply uh, reiterate uh, a point that Dr. Kane uh, just made, and that is uh, we, we will be working collaboratively with the state uh, because this is not that this is fundamentally not simply a Marion County issue, uh, but rather uh, and with the balanced school calendars, uh, you know, our schools are opening um, much earlier than well, when I was young. Um, some schools open, uh, you know, late July, early August. So uh, we will continue to, to uh, reach out and uh, communicate with all the public school superintendents here in Marion County. They are they're dedicated professionals uh, and they are dedicated, I know, to doing the right thing for their students. Uh, but we will do so in collaboration, obviously, with the governor with the state of Indiana and the Department of Education. Thank you all for joining us today. There will be a press release as well as shareable graphics and further information about the programs the mayor mentioned that will be going out later this afternoon. Thank you.